Welcome to the Texas Heart Institute educational programs featuring cardiology in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. The topic of today's presentation is testing, treatments, and vaccines for COVID-19. I'm Zvan Krejcer. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health Baylor St. Luke's. Uh, joining me today for this program is Dr. Stephanie Coulter. She's an assistant medical director at Texas Heart Institute and also director at the Center for Women's Heart and Vascular Health, as well as a program director of Cardiology Disease Fellowship and also director of Cardiology Education. Welcome, Dr. Coulter. Thank you so much. And Dr. Crazier, thank you for hosting and agreeing to participate and helping us stay on track through all these um, um, cardiology in the time of COVID um, videos that we've in, um, started recently. Today we have the, we're very fortunate because today we have with us Dr. Gallant Chan, who's the Director of Medical Education and Internal Medicine here at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. She's also an Assistant Professor of Medicine and is an Infectious Disease Specialist and has been quite involved in the preparation for our hospital for COVID um, specific um, developments. And we're so pleased to have her today to talk to us about testing, treatment options, and vaccine development where the Baylor College of Medicine is really playing a vital role. Um, and so we're just really thankful that you're here with us today, Gallant. I know you're quite busy and you're needed in the hospital a lot, but we're actually interested in because the great question out there is if you watch any of the news programs is everybody's talking about the testing what's available how useful are these tests and what tests are we using and what are available in our hospital and our medical center at the current time well thank you so much dr coulter and dr crazier for having me here um, to talk with you guys i'm looking forward to our discussion but that's an excellent question uh, right now, the majority of tests that are um, available are uh, sorry, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction tests. They're RT-PCR tests. Um, and right now, the CDC is recommending that nasopharyngeal swabs are collected in order to run the RT-PCR. Um, other acceptable options include oral pharyngeal swab and nasal uh, mid turbinate swabs as well. And then for patients who have a productive cough, expectorated sputum is another option, although they emphasize that induction of sputum is not recommended because of safety for the collector and uh, the risk of aerosolization with induction of sputum. We do know that for patients where a lower respiratory tract aspirate or a BAL sample is possible, um, we can also run the RT-PCR tests on those samples. So, uh, Dr. Chen, can you tell us how accurate are those tests from the information that we have currently available? Yes, so we know that in general, the test is relatively specific. There, are, there is the possibility of false positives um, in the laboratory tests, mostly um, contamination of samples uh, that are run in the lab but in general, relatively specific. Now, in regards to false negatives, um, we do know that that varies significantly depending on the quality and the type of specimen and depending on the test. Right now, there's a large number of commercially available tests, um, tests via the public sector and individual labs um, at academic institutions. And so depending on the test and depending on the quality and the type of sample, you may see a different uh, negative predictive value. Uh, we were speaking earlier about the negative predictive value and how much that depends on our pretest probability. Mm. And so for our patients who, um, where we are seeing clinical COVID um, and have a high pretest probability, uh, we will sometimes see negative RT-PCR tests and uh, opt to repeat the test in order to increase the sensitivity of the test. So um, uh, when we look at the different types of specimens, here this table is from a Chinese uh, study, uh, but looks at the, uh, 
positive percentage from various types of specimens. And you can see that from bronco alveolar lavage, 93% of samples were positive. Um, this is looking at over a thousand samples in uh, over 200 COVID positive patients. Mm -hmm. um, whereas compared to sputum, you have about 72% positive, nasopharyngeal swabs being about 63% positive and the oral uh, swabs were much uh, less likely to be positive um, at about 32%. They also looked at other specimens, urine, blood, feces, um, depending on the patient. But so you can see clearly here that depending on the type of specimen that's collected um, and the quality of that specimen. So remember that nasopharyngeal swabs are not always the most comfortable. Um, it does require some training in order to, to, for the patient and for the collector to obtain a high quality swab. Um, and so we know that the sensitivity does, uh, is affected by, by those factors. So if I, if I may ask you uh, just additional question related to this, most of the testing, particularly in, in our region or in our country is a nasal swab and also pharyngeal swab. And we can see that we can certainly miss a lot of those patients that definitely have uh, COVID-19. And of course, we cannot do a bronchoalveolar lavage on everybody. Actually, very few will get that. So that could give us a, a false hope that the patient might not have infection and actually there might be an infection. Yes, so it is true that the CDC recommends nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, oropharyngeal swab is a possibility, although they recommend um, nasal swabs because they have seen that uh, the viral loads are higher in nasopharyngeal swabs and sensitivity is higher. Having said that, as you can see, sensitivity is nowhere close to 100%. So uh, we are likely missing um, uh, infections by only using RT-PCR. So that brings me to testing by serology. Um, it is a test that's approved by the FDA now, uh, looking at IgM and IgG antibodies via ELISA. Um, so there are studies looking at improvement of sensitivity for diagnosis, combining the PCR along with an IgM test. Um, those are studies, data mostly out from China. But if you look at um, both IgM and PCR together, uh, we're looking closer to 95% sensitivity. So you're catching um, a much larger proportion of those who are infected. Um, these studies also looked at the timing of, uh, so we're able to see that PCR, uh, viral loads by PCR are much higher in the first seven days of illness, um, and that in general, IgM becomes positive, seroconversion happens in about half of all patients after seven days, um, and all patients after 14 days. So combining those two will likely boost that sensitivity of the of diagnosis. Well, that would certainly be helpful in helping to take care of our patients where testing is incomplete and it's not really available. So in our hospital at the current time, we are doing PCR and we're hopeful that we'll have serology tests soon. Is that right, Gallon? Yes, so right now it's approved for very select, uh, the serology tests are approved for very select labs. Um, our hospital right now, as most hospitals are using the PCR tests, we're looking at more rapid PCR tests along with rapid serology tests. Um, so I think on the horizon are those developments, rapid tests uh, with quicker turnaround time for both PCR and also for antibody. Uh, but for right now, PCR is the most widespread um, way of diagnosing COVID in our country uh, and, and being in our hospital. And Gallant, how long are we waiting currently to get a test back by PCR? Is it a day? Is it done in hospital yet? So the exciting thing is that we should have something online within the next week or so to do in-house. So that turnaround time would be closer to a couple of hours as opposed to a day or two. Um, 
The rapid tests are uh, essentially automated versions of the PCR test so that a lot of the steps can be done um, in an automated, efficient way uh, in cartridges that are, uh, that are packaged together and, and distributed to different labs across the country. So we're hoping to get uh, some of that online uh, within the next week or so. Well, that would be super helpful because we're blowing through the PPE on patients that are presumed COVID that maybe won't, wouldn't require so much protective gear so we could save it up for the patients who need it, you know, and extend our, our half-life of our supplies. I'm worried about yeah. that. Right. And so, right. It is a couple of issues. It's, it's the turnaround time, but it's also the sensitivity. So having uh, something like a serology test along with the PCR test would help boost that sensitivity. R rapidity of the results um, are key as well, as you mentioned, regarding um, uh, conservation of PPE and uh, isolation resources. Yes. Uh, we also know that looking at, sens looking at serologies, um, including IgG, can help us determine who potentially could be immune uh, uh, to COVID, to the coronavirus. Um, so that could help us in terms of deploying workforce or even things like using convalescent plasma for therapy. So tell me, uh, Gallant, what are the other important testing tips uh, for us that are ordering those tests, other than you who are an expert in that? Yeah, so I mentioned um, uh, already that PCR is really our primary way of testing right now. Serology, hopefully, to come on board soon. Uh, viral culture is something that's done for research, but for, in terms of clinical specimens, uh, really should not be submitted for viral culture uh, for safety reasons. Um, and then, I already mentioned this, but because pretest probability is so important in terms of our negative predictive values for the test, that if you have a high clinical suspicion for COVID-19 in a patient, repeat testing is something to consider, knowing that right now our PCR tests are not 100% sensitive, um, and that depending on when you're testing in that disease progression, uh, viral loads may uh, be higher or lower. So um, higher at the beginning of the uh, infection and lower um, as you progress in general. But Gallant, currently, so sorry to interrupt you, but currently we have a lot of interest in having people ask us, I'm asymptomatic, can I have a test to prove that if I've had it or not? Um, and we're not currently recommending PCR tests for asymptomatic individuals because the viral load in that group would may just be too low to detect if it's not symptomatic. Am I right? So I think the uh, jury is out on that. We don't know. Uh, honestly, we don't have a lot of great data on testing of asymptomatic patients. So we don't know. Um, you know presumably their viral loads would be lower, but uh, we don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the sensitivity um, of our test, our PCR test for that population. And so I uh, worry that if we have uh, constraints on our testing capabilities currently, if we were to use uh, those tests for asymptomatic patients, that potentially we are not, um, uh, again, we, are, we wouldn't necessarily be gaining valuable information. Um, but I think that if serology tests come online, that that would be an interesting yeah. option uh, to look at for asymptomatic patients uh, to see who uh, potentially has mounted immune response to uh, coronavirus. Okay, can you tell us about some of the treatments that we're advocating for for the treatment of coronavirus? Yeah, absolutely. I did want to mention just one last thing about testing, that it is important uh, to test for other pathogens because we do know co-infection with other viruses, um, including influenza and other bacteria, um, has been uh, reported. And so it's important 
uh, even if your clinical suspicion for COVID-19 is high, to still check for the other pathogens that could be causing lower respiratory infection. But in regards to the other treatments, uh, this is a nice figure from science uh, highlighting some of the possible therapies and where they work uh, in the replication cycle of SARS-CoV-2. Um, I'm going to use this really to uh, illustrate some of the different treatment options. So, for example, remdesivir is an antiviral that was initially developed for therapy of Ebola and other related viruses. Um, it is a nucleotide analog that inhibits the viral RNA polymerase and prevents uh, viral replication that way. It's already demonstrated activity against MERS and SARS-CoV-1 in vitro and in animal studies. Um, and there are case reports of success with remdesivir for COVID-19. Right now, our uh, hospital is part of a multi-center trial to determine efficacy for uh, COVID-19. So we're excited to be part of that trial. Is it just uh, remdesivir that's in this trial or is it in combination with anything else? It's an adaptive, it's a randomized control trial and it's an adaptive study that uh, potentially could allow for the addition of other arms uh, depending on uh, what therapies uh, seem promising. So then I wanted to also address hydroxychloroquine, which has been, we know, in the media a lot lately. Um, it works in a uh, more general way. Its antiviral activity is in decreasing the acidity in endosomes. But I would start by saying that the data supporting hydroxychloroquine is pretty thin at this point. Um, we know that SARS-CoV-2 actually the primary route of entry for that virus is via a different route through binding of that ACE2 receptor um, on the cell membrane of host tissues like lung epithelial cells or alveolar cells. And so hydroxychloroquine is really targeting a different route of entry, this endocytosis um, that, that cells can use to ingest uh, things like viruses. But in vitro studies in cell culture have shown some activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it's really important that we remember that in those studies, they used uh, pretty high doses. And of course, in the um, in vitro studies, you have the luxury of not worrying about any adverse effects um, and things like uh, ventricular arrhythmias or prolonged QT intervals and other cardiac to toxicities, which we have seen in patients um, uh, who are being treated with hydroxychloroquine. So it's important to remember that part of it, but also that in vitro studies don't always translate um, to uh, effects in humans. So mm -hmm. we know that, for example, in the past in vitro studies, um, uh, showed that hydroxychloroquine worked against viruses like dengue, but then when they went to uh, randomized clinical trials in humans, uh, it didn't really pan out in terms of um, uh, efficacy for, for those other viruses. Uh, so I think it's important to, uh, to think about that before um, we make recommendations for its use in, in treatment of uh, COVID-19. Callan, I have one word of caution in that we set up a lot of guidelines to limit um, telemetry monitoring in COVID or COVID presumed patients and such that, you know, the patients that may be at greatest risk for COVID or those that have underlying cardiovascular disease may actually be at some increased risk for the development of long QT syndrome, particularly when given in combination with the azithromycin. We actually had a case in our hospital that was being presumptively treated who did develop torsade and, and had to be cardioverted or, you know, intervened, which is actually concerning because it requires a lot of people running in and out of the room. So 
if you're going to put the patient on these drugs that prolong the QT, we recommend that you, you do monitor the heart rhythm and uh, make sure that it's safe to do so. Absolutely. And I think that really highlights uh, that all medications really have potential adverse effects and mm -hmm. none of these treatments right now have strong randomized um, clinical trial data to support uh, their use in uh, COVID-19. And so when we, um, you know, in, in thinking about what's out there in the media, um, we really have to think about our patients, what their underlying comorbidities are, what their risks for arrhythmias and other um, uh, cardiac issues are, and, um, and be cautious mm -hmm. in uh, using some of these medications. That's why we have clinical trials, and we will talk a little bit more about it later. <clears throat> yeah, so the, to add to that, the hydroxychloroquine is one of the four agents that will be studied in the WHO solidarity trial. Um, interestingly, they didn't initially include hydroxychloroquine, but I think because of the media interest, uh, they ended up including it as one of the one of its uh, one of the four agents that that it'll, it'll study. So hopefully we will get some data soon um, about uh, whether it is actually effective. We know from observational studies um, out of France that hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin um, potentially uh, uh, led to faster viral clearance um, in some um, improved clinical outcomes, but in that situation, because of the observational design, you really don't know if it's a causative um, issue, and if you you don't really know uh, without a control uh, whether those patients would have gotten better anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's hard to say. There are some small uh, randomized uh, trials now coming out of uh, China. Um, there was one small study with 30 patients that showed no effect, and then another one with about 60 patients that did show maybe a day's worth of uh, difference in terms of uh, resolution of fever and resolution of cough. Uh, but again, uh, underpowered, without a placebo, um, so it's really hard to, uh, to, to say that that is a strong support for the use of uh, this medication. Well, what, what about some other antiviral uh, treatments? Uh, can you mention uh, some information? Sure. Yeah, so another um, medication that people had been thinking about was uh, lopinavir ritonavir, which has really been used for the past 20 years or so to treat HIV. Lopinavir is a protease inhibitor, uh, which means that it inhibits that HIV protease enzyme, which cleaves the long protein chain into peptides uh, in order to assemble the viral particles. Uh, ritonavir is also a protease inhibitor and is used to really boost the effect and the duration of the effect of lopinavir um, so that's not degraded in, in, um, in the patient. Uh, so it works well for HIV um, and it had uh, been shown in uh, animal studies to be effective against coronaviruses like MERS. Um, however, there was a recently published randomized trial from China that showed no effect in COVID-19, uh, although the authors cautioned that the patients they were looking at were very critically ill. Um, about a fifth of them uh, died in the study. And so uh, the thought was that potentially this therapy was given late in the disease course and maybe uh, too late to really have uh, an effect in terms of its uh, antiviral activity. So this is also one of the four agents included in the WHO solidarity trial. So again, hoping for some uh, stronger uh, high quality data. Or maybe just timing the virus when it's replicating to administration of the drug may be much more beneficial than waiting until the virus has enacted a cytokine storm. 
So yeah, and that you know, Dr. Coulter, that brings me to uh, another therapeutic option. Tocilizumab is an IL-6 receptor inhibitor. We know that patients with severe uh, COVID uh, do experience something like a clinical cytokine release syndrome with elevated IL-6 levels. So the idea is that tocilizumab um, would help to blunt that inflammatory response and help blunt that cytokine storm and potentially lead to uh, uh, better clinical outcomes. And that's really right now, uh, we've only seen that in anecdotal reports, case reports of good outcomes uh, with tocilizumab, but there's really, again, no high quality randomized controlled trial yet. Uh, at our institution, we do have an industry sponsored uh, multi-center uh, uh, trial. We are part of that multi-center trial uh, for tocilizumab. What about a convalescent plasma? We have heard recently there are several institutions uh, in the United States and one here in Houston that's actually advocating the use of uh, this modality of treatment in patients with COVID-19. Yeah, so I think that's an exciting option as well. Um, we uh, know that convalescent plasma was reported to have worked in a uh, case series of five critically ill patients in China. Um, but again, it's a small number of patients. I think the real challenges will be finding appropriate donors and uh, testing to confirm that uh, there is neutralizing activity of the plasma. But that is also uh, something that our institution is involved in now. Um, a, a small convalescent plasma uh, trial underway. So let me ask you, and this might uh, be a little bit difficult to answer, but when is the most appropriate time to consider this mode of treatment? Early or uh, could it work uh, in more advanced cases or uh, what, are, what is the current understanding when the plasma should work in the best way? Yeah, so it seems to me, you know, looking at the different agents that we've just talked about, none, again, none of which have really been um, supported by strong randomized uh, clinical trial data. But it seems to me that antiviral, uh, specific antiviral medication uh, would work in uh, mild to moderate cases earlier in the disease course when you're trying to stop viral, rapid viral replication, and that uh, the IL-6 inhibitors like tocilizumab or other agents that work on the IL-6 pathway would work in order to uh, blunt that cytokine storm and that inflammatory response that happens in more severe COVID cases. Um, for convalescent plasma, we really only have anecdotal data in very critically ill patients. It has not been used uh, for mild cases, and um, or at least I haven't seen any data on that. So all we have is uh, the scant uh, data in very critically ill patients. Um, but, but Gowan, the fact that there's some pretty, I mean, that those five patients got much improved and they were pretty much dying. So. You know, of all the things that I've seen so far, I mean, this looks the most entertaining and promising so far. So I'm assuming there's a lot of logistical hurdles to find the appropriate donors. But is it mechanically difficult to, you know, prepare the specimens in a hospital setting? Is it cumbersome? Yeah, so that uh, it really depends on the capabilities of your pathology lab. I think in a uh, large academic center like ours, we have some of the finest um, pathology departments um, and pathologists. So, you know, if anyone can do it, we can. Um, but it is a uh, logistical uh, challenge to find the appropriate donors, screen the appropriate donors, um, because you're not only, when you're talking about plasma, um, you're not only looking at 
one antibody. There are mm -hmm. any other antigens uh, to consider. And so... Um, and you have to be care careful about other antigenic stimulation. So you have to be in the right ABO blood type compatibility. Am I right? That's a given. Yeah. yeah. So that as well. But, but really, um, I think we're, we're looking, uh, we're hopeful about uh, this, but it is, it's something that I'm not sure I could imagine uh, to be given uh, in I guess to large numbers of patients right. because of the logistical challenges. Exactly. But for those so, that are really sick, it could right. be a possibility. Right. So Gallant, you mentioned already several clinical trials that are going to be started or the, they're ongoing at the Run present away. time. But uh, let's uh, give us a, a perspective, an overview where we are, how many trials are there ongoing currently? And yeah. uh, what are your expectations? So this was uh, weeks ago. This is a list of selected clinical trials for treating COVID-19 um, from uh, weeks ago. But honestly, you know, that number grows by the day. And mm -hmm. so it's quite exciting. In addition to therapies, uh, vaccines are really what um, next on the horizon and oh, that, um, everyone is looking uh, towards vaccines because that is really um, hopefully what can get us back to um, uh, get, get us to some level of protection to allow us um, to really get back to how you know maybe our, our normal lives used to be. Mm. Interesting. So uh, let me ask you, I recently uh, read that there, this will be a challenge because, and I don't know how important it is, but at least at the present time, they identified eight different strains of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, so is this going to be a challenge because we have so many strains or are those strains maybe less important because there are a lot of similarities between those strains and the vaccine will cover all of them or most of them. Yeah, so there are um, there are a large number of potential vaccines in development right now. Um, the last I checked, there were approximately 40 or more uh, potential vaccines in development. Um, uh, SARS, you know, some of the uh, work really had been done years before we ever knew of the existence of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that work uh, done on SARS-CoV-1 and MERS um, has really helped to uh, bolster the effort now because there is a high degree of genetic similarity between those uh, two viruses, SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2. Uh, we know that their genomes are uh, almost 90% identical and that um, because of that, uh, what researchers, you know, researchers aren't really starting from square one at this point, that mm -hmm. they're using their previous experience and repurposing the technologies that they developed before to try to uh, potentially develop a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, in regards to different strains, we uh, hope that it is, uh, and not a virus that is mutating quickly um, and that really the targets, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, potential vaccine strategies, but really that the uh, targets would be conserved um, mm. uh, across those strains so that uh, vaccines would uh, work against, um, against the viruses. Uh, but really one major hurdle I would say uh, that has been identified in the work on SARS-CoV-1 vaccines is this undesired uh, immunopotentiation. So an enhancement mm -hmm. of an immune response um, that uh, uh, is a safety issue really for people receiving the vaccine. Um, I wanted to highlight a few different vaccine strategies, whole virus vaccines, uh, recombinant protein subunit vaccines, and then also the nucleic acid vaccines. 
which are currently, uh, they just started in enrolling um, uh, patients in a phase one clinical trial for that, uh, for the last one. So whole virus vaccines uh, are really the classic strategy for vaccines. And when we think about uh, viruses, so live attenuated or inactivated whole virus, and really the uh, major advantage is that you know that the whole virus tends to be very immunogenic, so it'll give you that immune response. It has an inherent ability to stimulate um, uh, that, uh, that immune response in the, in the toll receptors that are necessary to recognize those uh, viral pathogens. Um, but really, it's important to make sure that these vaccines are safe because we do know that uh, live vaccines, uh, you know, we, we do know that we have to make sure that they're um, safe for use before they're approved. So it potentially could take longer to go through the process of uh, clinical trials and safety uh, trials to make sure that we have that data to support it. Um, then recombinant protein subunit vaccines are something that uh, uh, our institution is working hard on. Um, the idea is to elicit an immune response against that S-spike protein, which is the protein that binds to that ACE2 receptor on the human tissue um, uh, cell membrane. And it prevents, it, it would potentially prevent docking with that ACE2 receptor in lung epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that situation, that you would have high levels of protective immunity, but that you would be minimizing that immunopotentiation that I was talking about earlier, that immune enhancement um, issue that could cause a safety uh, problem. So this is work that's been led by uh, the Texas Children's Hospital uh, Center for Vaccine Development, um, the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, along with uh, UTMB and the New York Blood Center, uh, but, and Dr. Hotez's group. Um, that has been working on this. And then finally, the nucleic acid uh, vaccines um, are uh, promising. They've entered now phase one clinical trials with 45 healthy volunteers in the Seattle area. Uh, so they, this really highlights the uh, rapidity with which vaccines are being developed. So uh, the company that uh, produced this vaccine sequenced the, the virus genome about two months ago and then already has a vaccine in uh, trials. So the, um, because of the pandemic, uh, they've really pushed vaccine development uh, through quickly. And that's uh, good in some ways because we know it is obviously a, a time sensitive issue, but then we do have to think about um, the, the drawbacks being uh, that we have to be very careful about uh, safety data and, and um, uh, think about whether these vaccines are safe in, in humans. So this is just a table from an overview of the vaccine pipeline uh, put out by our group with Dr. Botazi and Dr. Hotez um, at the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor. Um, but it highlights just uh, some of the uh, top candidates for coronavirus uh, vaccines. Uh, but really, I think that the um, you know, right now there's there's many more. This list is not exhaustive or complete in any way, but um, it really highlights that there are a lot of uh, public and private partnerships at work uh, to produce these vaccines. Uh, that each vaccine strategy here has different advantages and disadvantages, and uh, really only time will tell. You know, which one of these ends up. Uh, being shown to be safe and efficacious mm -hmm. um, and moving on to uh, actually be used for prevention of uh, COVID-19. Um, it's interesting, I heard that uh, there are private foundations 
uh, for example, the Gates Foundation, which is moving forward in terms of uh, production capabilities and uh, factories for multiple vaccine strategies and multiple vaccine uh, products um, uh, concomitantly while these are uh, being developed in order to try to uh, facilitate the production of whichever vaccine ends up uh, meeting approval standards. Alan, how long are we taking, how long do you think it is before a vaccine would be ready to be implemented in a population? 18 well, months? I know that Dr. Fauci has cited uh, 12 mm -hmm. to 18 months. Yeah. I think that he and uh, many others would likely say that that is an optimistic yeah. uh, estimate. Uh, but at the same time, having said that, um, I've also never heard of a vaccine moving uh, to clinical trials within two months of having right. the uh, viral genome sequence. So that is already a record. And so I think we are moving things uh, more rapidly than we have ever before. It's amazing how a little bitty single strand RNA virus can hold the world completely hostage. At this point, <laughs> at this point, whoever comes up with the strategy is going to hit a massive home run for mankind, for their financials. Um, so I could see why you would double down on whatever potential source is there and hope for the best. So we're going to hope for them all right. because otherwise we're in for a very long run. So um, Gallant, I have a, one of the important questions before we complete with this program. Close to, if not over 60 uh, physicians in Italy mm -hmm. died on uh, the front treating patients with COVID. 19. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of physicians that are on the front lines that are exposed to COVID-19 on a daily basis, uh, uh, particularly emergency room physicians. And uh, I have seen among those that died abroad and also in the United States, uh, the largest number are among emergency room physicians, they're gynecologists, they're urologists, but they're basically, and nurses, of course, a lot of a lot of uh, paramedical personnel as well that's in direct contact uh, with COVID-19 exposed or disease patient. So, uh, do you think that, uh, from your professional point of view, the viral load and repetitive viral load plays a significant uh, importance as far as the severity of the disease? Because we see that a lot of those individuals that. Uh, were on front lines that died were not old, they were young. Some of them were very young. So what is your opinion on it from uh, the infectious disease point of view? Yeah, so I do think that the inoculum effect is uh, something that may be playing a role. So the idea that a higher inoculum of virus potentially can lead to more severe disease. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, you know, that is, um, I think for a lot of the frontline uh, healthcare mm -hmm. workers, uh, that's the main concern. Um, not wow. the minuscule amount on your, you know, grocery bag that you accidentally touch one time, but really that you are in, um, for example, an ICU. Uh, where a large number of ventilated uh, patients with aerosolizing mm -hmm. viral particles um, mm -hmm. who are very sick themselves and potentially have high viral loads themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so ICU physicians, ED physicians, um, and staff, nursing staff, of course, who are exposed to those uh, um, uh, COVID patients are... Uh, really exposed to much higher viral loads than the average uh, person walking around outside of, um, you know, in the community. Uh, so that inoculum effect that you're speaking about, I think, is something that is uh, uh, real and unfortunately uh, something that uh, hits close to home for us. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, <clears throat> 
that that is that is very important, and uh, I believe that we all share the view that proper PPEs should be used in individuals, medical personnel, physicians that are exposed to uh, those type of patients. Absolutely, and you know that's really what's worrisome is hearing some of the accounts from front line, you know, from the front lines in areas that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, um, it, hearing about the lack of PPE. Um, we are in, we are using conservation, PPE conservation strategies in our own institution, but we have fortunately thus far n uh, not experienced the overwhelming volume that some of the other areas uh, in our country and in the world have experienced. And so, um, you know, I, I think that absolutely it's, it's very uh, worrisome and disturbing to hear about uh, physicians and nurses and other staff who don't have access to the appropriate PPE when they're really in the, um, really on the front lines and in those areas with the, with the highest inoculum. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think that's a really- Do you have any questions? Uh, before we complete well, the program. I, no, but I, I'm really appreciative, Gallon, of your your intellect and your knowledge of this subject, and you've educated the cardiology community quite a lot. I'm hopeful that the warm weather and the moist weather that's about to return to Houston affords us some protection. I can't believe I'm saying that, being a lifelong Texan, basically, that I'm looking forward to the warm and smuggy air that we're so famous for, but do you think that the warm air has any benefit to us down here? Do I think know? the jury's still out on that question. Yeah. Um, there has been uh, evidence that uh, this virus does just fine in uh, warm uh, and humid climates, but mm -hmm. I think that um, hopefully that, uh, you know, time will tell. Um, yeah, we're about to learn. Our, mitigation measures will uh, start to work around the same time that that warm weather is uh, ramping up and and maybe the combination of multiple factors uh, can hopefully uh, bring this epidemic under control. But, you know, nothing replaces the mitigation measures that our public health officials are recommending, um, social distancing and uh, what we're doing now, talking over uh, Zoom, is um, all of it, I think, it contributes uh, to hopefully flattening that curve and, and uh, making sure that our epidemic uh, does not overwhelm our healthcare system. And uh, hopefully, you know, I, I can say it comes to an end, but when, from what I've seen of viruses, it, they never truly end. Uh, they just, they give us a little break, maybe, um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be around for the next battle, hopefully. Thank you well, again, Gallant. Appreciate it you. so much. Thank you, Gallant, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, for your very valuable contribution to the Texas Heart Institute program on treatment, testing, and vaccine in the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me.